Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. Coming up on our program, with the unexpected passing of San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee this week, we look at his legacy and what lies ahead for San Francisco's leadership. Plus, we'll hear from former CIA Director Leon Panetta about international flashpoints from North Korea to the Middle East. But first, California Congresswoman Jackie Speer has introduced bipartisan legislation to crack down on sexual misconduct in Congress. Earlier this month, three lawmakers announced their resignation following sexual harassment allegations. Republican Trent Franks and Democrats John Conyers and Al Franken. Amid the ongoing national reckoning, Speer has also created a Twitter hashtag to raise awareness of the prevalence of sexual harassment. She recently shared her own story about being assaulted as a young congressional aide more than 40 years ago. Like so many of you, I have a Me Too story to share. I was working as a congressional staffer. The chief of staff held my face, kissed me, and stuck his tongue in my mouth. So I know what it's like to keep these things hidden deep down inside. I know what it's like to lie awake in bed at night wondering if I was the one who had done something wrong. I know what it's like years later to remember that rush of humiliation and anger. And joining me now is Congresswoman Jackie Speer of San Mateo County. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you, Twee. Well, I'll talk about sexual harassment with you in just a moment, but I'd like to ask you about the Russia probe. You sit on the House Intelligence Committee, and we're hearing now that there are a number of witnesses scheduled for next week, but none for January. So what does this mean? What is going on? Well, we can read between the lines, I think. And there is a rush to try and shut this committee investigation down. And this week was a great example. Three interviews going on simultaneously, one of them actually off the hill with someone who uh, comes to Washington frequently, but they wanted to do it now. And so we were actually off the hill doing the interview, had a race back to vote. Um, this is a circus at this point. So are they bowing to pressure from the White House? What do you think is going on? I believe that the president wants all of this shut down. He wants to shut down these investigations and he wants to fire um, special counsel Mueller. And is that what you're hearing? And, and is it going to happen before the end of the year? So the rumor on the Hill when I left yesterday was that the president was going to make a significant speech at the end of next week and on December 22nd, when we are out of D.C., he was going to fire Robert Mueller. What now, do you make of that? That is shocking if that were to if, happen. If that were to happen, that is, you know, um, Saturday Massacre uh, 2.0, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is replaying Nixon tapes. And it would be just an astonishing turn of events. It would create a constitutional crisis. Now, would Democrats try to impeach him? Would you call for his impeachment? I think without a doubt there would be an impeachment effort. But we have two houses controlled majority in each by Republicans. And since the House has to impeach and the Senate tries, an effort to try and impeach him would require you know, 218 votes in the House. And right now there are only 194 Democrats. Well, there is uh, so much to watch. Um, we will keep an eye on that. But I also want to ask you about sexual harassment as well. Uh, you have been so outspoken on this topic. This week, we saw an exchange between President Trump and Senator, uh, Senator uh, Kirsten Gillibrand of New York. She had called for him to resign because of sexual misconduct allegations. President Trump then responded by posting a tweet suggesting that Senator Gillibrand would, quote, do anything for campaign contributions. What do you make of all that? Well, at the time, I said it was grotesque and that it took my breath away. Imagine, this is the President of the United States um, making a comment like that of a colleague in the U.S. Senate. Now, he's done it to members of his own party in the Senate as well, whether it's Mitch McConnell or Jeff Flake or uh, uh, Senator Corker. And, you know, the, the truth is his conduct is so um, over the top. It crosses the line so often, not just with members of Congress, but with elected leaders around the world, that he is a real liability to us as Americans. And in fact, you are calling for an investigation by the U.S. 
Office of Government Ethics. And we should point out that he has denied all 19 allegations of sexual misconduct against him so far. So he has denied all 19. At the very least, these women have a right to be heard. And I'm recommending that we have hearings in the House if the Government Oversight and Reform Committee is unwilling to have those hearings, which the chair has basically said, based on what you're alleging here, this is criminal conduct, I'm referring this to the Department of Justice. Uh, we wrote back and said, well, we've had many instances uh, in the history of the Congress where there have been uh, Department of Justice investigations going on, be it Whitewater or Fast and Furious, any number of investigations where the House continued to do its work in terms of doing mm -hmm. public policy investigations, and that's what we should be doing as well. And, and we showed a clip from what you said earlier when you bravely stepped forward to talk about your own experience with sexual harassment on Capitol Hill, and you have now proposed a bill. And how would your bill change what you call the culture of sexual harassment on Capitol Hill? Well, first of all, let me say that we've taken a huge step forward. In 2014, I introduced legislation to require mandatory sexual harassment training prevention for members and staff. It wasn't even given an opportunity to be heard as an amendment. This year, we've already passed mm -hmm. it and it will take effect. The other component is the Me Too Congress Act, which will change the system, because right now it takes 90 days before a victim can actually file a complaint. There's mandatory mediation, there's a mandatory non-disclosure agreement. All of those things uh, should be voluntary and there should be a victim counsel representing the victim. So you will streamline the process. But, but is legislation enough, though? Because you were um, in the California Assembly and Senate. You wrote legislation mandating sexual harassment training. And yet we have a situation now in California where nearly 150 women uh, signed a letter decrying what they say is the culture of sexual harassment in Sacramento around the Capitol. Yes, let me tell you, that was so disturbing to hear about that after I had worked and seemingly had created an environment where there would be that kind of training. Well, training is not enough. It starts at the top and you do have to change the culture and you've got to make sure there's a place for victims to come and that they will have a soft landing afterwards. The reason why they don't come forward is because they can't afford to lose their jobs. We have just a little bit of time remaining, so I have to ask you about the tax reform package. Republican leaders say they believe they have the votes to pass this. What are you seeing or hearing behind the scenes? Do they have the votes? I think they will have the votes to pass it. You know, it's, it's kind of ironic. They, this bill has not had any hearings. It's being introduced today so that they can take action on Monday. We still don't know what's in it. We only have highlights right now. We haven't even seen a copy of the bill. And this is going to be rushed through the Congress and put on the president's desk so he can announce that he has given us a great Christmas present. Well, it's a great Christmas present for those that are at the top end and for corporations, not so much for those of us that are on the other side of that spectrum. All right, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, we appreciate your time and happy to see you here today. Thank you. Now to international affairs. Last week, President Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He also said he would move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The announcement was praised by Israeli leaders, but condemned by Palestinians. Meanwhile, North Korea's latest missile test is the most alarming yet, demonstrating a range capable of reaching the entire U.S. mainland. For a perspective on these international challenges, we hear now from Leon Panetta. He served as CIA director and defense secretary under President Obama. He was also White House chief of staff for President Bill Clinton. Director Panetta, thank you so much for being with us. Nice to be with you. We have uh, seen protests, some of them violent, over President Trump's announcement this month that the U.S. is now considering Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. Some experts have warned that this could be an end to the peace process. What is your take on this? Well, I, th I think it certainly was harmful to uh, the ability of the United States to uh, play a role uh, in negotiations. Uh, we have always traditionally uh, felt that uh, Jerusalem ought to be one of those issues that ought to be discussed uh, as part of the larger number of issues to be resolved in a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, and the fact that uh, the president now is taking that off the table uh, not only hurts our position in terms of being able to negotiate peace, uh, I think it also sends a bad signal uh, to others in the region with regards to their participation in a peace process.
What do you think is the strategy behind making the announcement at this time? It did seem rather sudden. I don't understand, uh, frankly, uh, what the strategy is here, because uh, all of his national security team, uh, plus the Secretary of State, uh, all urged him not to do this. Uh, but he went ahead and did it. Now, you know, obviously, he made a political commitment uh, during the campaign that he would do it. Uh, he probably viewed it as fulfilling his campaign promise. But when you become president, there are much more important issues to consider than just uh, whatever you may or may not have said in a political campaign. Another intensifying situation right now is North Korea, and just about every modern president has been frustrated by the options there. Uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is now saying that the U.S. is open to uh, talks and negotiations with North Korea without any preconditions. Does this signal a shift in strategy by the Trump administration? Well, it's, you know, it's hard to tell because uh, Secretary Tillerson will say one thing one day and then the White House uh, will reverse whatever he said the next day. I hope that uh, they do reach out. I, do, I hope that we can find a way to sit down and try to resolve these issues. Uh, North Korea, without question, represents a very serious threat to our national security. Do you think the approach so far is exacerbating tensions? We have Senator Lindsey Graham, for example, saying that uh, publicly that he thinks there's a three in 10 chance that the Trump administration would strike first and even a seven in 10 chance if they were to launch another missile test. What, what kind of impact is that kind of language and rhetoric having on our relationship with North Korea? Well, I, I don't think it helps very much. Uh, the problem is, is you increase these tensions uh, the chance for some kind of miscalculation or mistake uh, increases. Uh, and uh, the key right now, it seems to me, is that the United States has to continue uh, a policy that really stresses uh, containment and deterrence. Uh, and that means building up our military presence there, uh, creating some kind of missile shield that will protect uh, Japan and South Korea as well as the United States. Uh, and continuing to put pressure on both China and Russia to uh, increase sanctions and to try to urge the North Koreans to sit down and negotiate. That's really the primary strategy. A military option uh, is, uh, and I'm, I'm very familiar with that, having worked on plans uh, to provide a military option. The problem is there are no good options because the consequences would be uh, the result of uh, uh, of a nuclear war uh, and millions of lives lost. And that, very frankly, is not uh, an option that we ought to play with. Uh, Director Panetta, I also wanted to ask you about the Mueller investigation. We have seen a number of guilty pleas, including from Michael Flynn. What do you think of the direction of that investigation so far? And where do you think it might be headed next? Well, I, I know Bob Mueller. Uh, I have tremendous respect for him. I worked very closely with him uh, when I was uh, director of the CIA, and he was FBI director. Uh, and uh, I think he is uh, somebody uh, of great integrity. He's a professional. He is a law enforcement official. Uh, his primary objective is to find the truth. Uh, and I have a great deal of trust and confidence in his ability to determine what the truth is here. Uh, there's no question that uh, the Russians uh, tried to interfere in our election process. Uh, that is supported by 17 intelligence agencies. Uh, the real question is, what was the role of the Trump campaign and individuals next to the president and the president himself uh, as to whether or not there was any effort to, uh, uh, to in fact, uh, conspire with the Russians in this effort? So I, I think the real challenge here is to allow Mr. Mueller the opportunity to continue to conduct his investigation. He's made good progress. Uh, let's give him the room to determine exactly what happened and what the truth is. We have a responsibility to find out what happened, who was involved, and make sure that it never happens again. Mr. Panetta, we talked with you uh, earlier this year, right around the time of the inauguration. And back then, you said you had some con concerns about Mr. Trump's governing style, uh, but that you would adopt a wait-and-see attitude. It's not about a year later. What are your thoughts on the direction that President Trump has taken so far? Well, I've. I've been in public life uh, 50 years uh, and uh, worked uh, one way or another with uh, almost nine presidents. Uh, this 
this president has clearly changed the office of the presidency. Uh, Republican and Democratic presidents uh, always felt that uh, the presidency uh, ought to be dignified, uh, that it ought to uh, embrace the values of this country, uh, that presidents ought to work to unify this country, uh, not divide it, uh, and that presidents ought to appeal to the best in Americans, not the worst. Uh, in addition to that, this president has changed policies that both Republican and Democratic presidents have embraced, whether it's on trade, uh, whether it's with regards to climate change, whether it's uh, involving issues like uh, Jerusalem, whether it's issues involving health care. Uh, and uh, the president, in basically disrupting these policies, has not really developed a strategy for how he's going to replace what he's done. So uh, I think the verdict at the end of this first year is that we've had a presidency in chaos. Whether or not it will straighten out, whether or not this president will change in office, I doubt it. Uh, that remains the question, because I think the country is becoming increasingly concerned about the direction that we're taking. Director Panetta, thank you so much for being with us, joining us from Monterey. Happy holidays to you and your family. And a happy holiday to you, too, and, and all of your listeners. All right, thank you. We turn our attention now to the unexpected passing of San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee this week. He died Tuesday, reportedly of a heart attack. He was San Francisco's first Asian-American mayor and dedicated decades of his career to service in city government. Under his leadership, San Francisco enjoyed a boom in the tech sector and boldly embraced its sanctuary city status. But with the economic boom came skyrocketing housing prices, and homelessness continues to be a challenge for the city. Joining me now to discuss Mayor Lee's legacy and where San Francisco goes from here are State Assembly member and former San Francisco Supervisor David Chu, San Francisco Chronicle City Hall reporter Rachel Swan, and KQED Politics and Government Senior Editor Scott Schaefer. Nice to have all of you here. Thanks for having us. Uh, the public memorial service for Mayor Lee is this weekend. And Assemblyman Chu, let's start with you. How would you describe his legacy? I think as we're all reflecting and, and, and grieving, we're all thinking about what that legacy is going to be. Uh, for me, part of it is going to be uh, working with uh, many of us at City Hall to bring an era of civility and consensus building. I think that was important. Uh, certainly, he tackled the challenges of the day from bringing us, uh, working to bring us out of the Great Recession to addressing the housing crisis we have. Uh, I would say certainly for the Chinese American community, his uh, historical ascension as a first Chinese American in our city, I think these are all parts of, of his legacy and, and we will certainly be reflecting on more. Rachel? I mean, Ed Lee came up th in City Hall as a um, city administrator, as head of public works at one point. Um, he was, one thing that was unique about him is he was very passionate about nuts and bolts type issues, not necessarily like the things that drive headlines, but he cared a lot about small businesses. He cared a lot about uh, recycling, environmental issues, fixing potholes. These were the things that really got him going. Things that um, mattered to residents in yeah, neighborhoods. Yeah, you know, and he was known for, you know, taking walks around the city, I guess, without his staff and um, visiting business owners and yeah, I, I would add to that that uh, he's going to have, I think, a, a complicated legacy, starting with how he became mayor. You know, he was an accidental mayor. He never ran for office, never held office, never really wanted to be uh, a public official, you know. And But he, he stuck around and uh, was here for seven years. And uh, I think, as, as Assemblyman Chu said, he did sort of bring a um, tranquility that had been uh, missing. There was a lot of bitterness between the mayor's office and the board of supervisors before that. But he also, you know, he, he, he presided over a dramatic change change in the city, and I know we'll talk about some of those things. There were big winners and big losers, yeah. and I think some felt that the city's character really has changed in the last seven years, and it's a very mixed record in terms of how people feel about that. And a number of people would say well, the tech industry was a winner in all this, right? When he took office seven years ago, he said his top priority was jobs, jobs, jobs. He did accomplish that. The unemployment rate in the city now is 2.7 percent. But with that growing wealth came a host of other problems, Scott. Huge. And I think, you know, almost any mayor in America would love to have had the economy that Ed Lee presided over and helped create with the Twitter tax cuts and everything. But there were, yes, as you said, there were problems. I mean, uh, the affordability 
vulnerability crisis really exploded because there was an influx of people. There were so many jobs, high paying jobs in, in the city. Uh, and so the population went up by tens of thousands. And of course, that put a demand on housing. Uh, traffic is worse. Uh, you know, he also happened to be mayor at a time when Lyft and Uber kind of exploded. And so I think the quality of life issues, uh, traffic, cost of living, homelessness. I mean, those are really unresolved issues that uh, in some ways were made worse in part by the tech explosion. Did he make progress on homelessness? That was his other top priority, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, I I would say looking back, um, Ed Lee, maybe you could say in his at the beginning of his second term, perhaps earlier, he sort of pivoted from being the jobs mayor to being the housing mayor, um, at least in terms of like his messaging and his focus. Um, he opened the navigation centers. Navigation centers became very much part of the Ed Lee brand. Um, I mean, and they're a big thing in San Francisco. I mean, the top concern on most voters' minds is homelessness and the visibility of homelessness and clearing up the encampments, for better or worse. Um, so he started the, I mean, he got the Department of Homelessness started with support from the board. Um, he um, got the navigation centers. But started, we, built but a lot we, of support, supportive housing. Yeah, yeah but, but yet we still see the tents taking over the sidewalks in many neighborhoods in San Francisco. So it sounds like he made some progress, but mm -hmm. it's still very much an intractable problem. He's, he's facing a city with very glaring income inequality and some things that are... And I, I would, excuse me, I would just yeah. say in fairness, I think so is yeah. Sam Licardo in San Jose and yeah. Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles. I mean, these are big city problems and they're exacerbated, as you said, by the inequality of income. Uh, Assemblyman Chu, London Breed is currently the acting mayor. She's also the president of the Board of Supervisors. What can we expect to see from her in terms of priorities? You were once a supervisor yourself. Well, I think um, clearly the, the challenges that are facing our city are what our acting mayor and the Board of Supervisors and all of us who are city leaders need to focus on. Uh, focusing on continuing to address the, the housing crisis, homelessness on our streets, the, the congestion that Scott talked about, uh, the income inequality. Um, and I think it's important for us uh, in, the, in the wake of the tragedy that's happened for us to figure out how to pull together and, and continue to build consensus on uh, these challenges that have, uh, uh, that certainly San Francisco had uh, been dealing with in the last couple of years, Mayor Lee had been dealing with. Uh, but some of these are issues that, uh, that mayors, many mayors, including uh, you know, half a dozen mayors who've tried to tackle homelessness have had to deal with. And, and, is, and what is Lyndon Breed's governing style? Can she pull that consensus uh, together? You know, Mayor Lee was, mm -hmm. Non flashy. He was dubbed Steady Eddie at City Hall. What is London Breed's style? Well, uh, she's the she's the board president, and um, you know she's she's been good at running the board meetings. Um, she's not a heavy hitter with legislation. She's not a not a Scott Weiner or David Campos or dare I say a David Chu. Um, her big issue this. This year has been safe injection sites. She helped form the safe injection site task force. Um, but it remains to be seen whether she can be a great unifier in City Hall. Yeah, I mean, I think her first job is to really show stability, you know, that mm -hmm. the city's gonna continue to run, not shake up, you're not gonna see her firing department heads. I think the biggest change you'll see is in personality. I mean, Ed Lee was famously, as you said, steady Eddie, low key, he was not a, you know, when he walked into a room, it didn't, like, heads didn't turn, and, you know, he was a very low key guy. She's not that way. I mean, she, she's very, uh, she has a big personality, she's funny, a little profane, <laughs> uh, not afraid to <laughs> drop a few, uh, you know, profanities here and there. Uh, and so I think she'll, uh, she's going to have to learn what her style is because she hasn't played on this kind of a stage. I mean, this is an enormous difference being mayor versus Board of Supervisors president. And again, she's acting mayor. There will be uh, an election on June 5th to choose a new mayor. Assembly Manchu, you ran against uh, Mayor Lee in 2011. And um, are you thinking of running for me on June 5th when the election rolls around. You know, I've uh, been, in the last couple of days, I've told folks that uh, I wish that uh, everyone at City Hall could have a 72 hour or one week moratorium to, to grief, because I think at this time we all need to to take stock uh, and to thank Mayor Lee in our different ways and to grieve on the tragedy that just occurred. Um, but obviously, uh, 
uh, city leaders will think about the future of the city at the appropriate time, and it's important for us to, uh, to again, come together, figure out how we move things forward, uh, and to carry on those aspects of, of Ed Lee's legacy, including his civility, including his focus on, on delivering results and getting things done. Fair enough, but that wasn't a no either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will leave it there. Um, the, you know, uh, London Breed, regarding her role now as acting mayor, uh, will she be able to hang on to that, Scott? Or do you think the Board of Super Supervisors will likely take a vote, try to appoint someone else as interim mayor? Well, that'll be, uh, they're certainly talking about that. They may not want to talk about it publicly, but they're talking about it among themselves. There's a, you know, you have to get to six votes and she can't vote for herself. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's some thought that they may want to level the playing field. I mean, it's been, I think 2003 was the last time we had a, a mayor's race that was open and where there wasn't an incumbent running or someone that had a leg up, Gavin Newsom versus uh, Matt Gonzalez. And so I think there's, there may be a hunger and maybe even still a little resentment that that didn't happen when Gavin Newsom left office. And so I think you may see somebody appointed by the board who is not, definitely not going to run, somebody who's older, uh, somebody who's like Louise Rennie, for example, or Ed Harrington, the former city uh, controller. I haven't heard those names in a, quite a while. Well, but I think, yeah. you know, someone like that m would be fairly sure not to run. Mm. I mean, Louise Rennie's got to be 80 two or something, you know, and so, uh, but I don't think you're gonna see it, say, one of the people thinking of running, say, Jane Kim, Mark Farrell, who may well wanna run, I don't think you're gonna see them get six votes at the board, because then you have the same problem that they perceive with London Breed, which is having a sort of a head start. Okay, well, much to watch, but again, this weekend will be spent honoring the life and legacy of Ed Lee, and I wanna thank you all for being here today. Assemblyman David Chu, Rachel Swan, San Francisco Chronicle City Hall reporter, and also our politics and government senior editor, Scott Schaefer, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And that will do it for us. Please tune in over the next two weeks for our encore show on the arts in the Bay Area and our half hour special, Stand Up San Quentin. And we'll be back in the new year with our regular weekly show. You can find more of our coverage at kqed.org slash newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. Thank you for joining us, and we wish you and your families a wonderful holiday season. <laughs>